Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and I want you to take note of Gavin Rosdale. He rose to fame in the mid-1990s with his band Bush, who had numerous hit singles like Glycerine, Machine Head, Come Down, the latter of which he will tell you a very surprising fact about in this podcast. Well, at least it was very surprising to me. Bush's albums have also been pretty dang successful, including their six-time multi-platinum debut, 16 Stone, and the number one follow-up, Razorblade Suitcase. Bush released four albums before breaking up in 2002, and 2002 was also the year that Gavin Rosdale married Gwen Stefani, who at the time was the lead singer for No Doubt. I mention all this because he mentions it in our interview, and they were married for 14 years. Bush reformed in 2010 and have released four new albums since, including this year's The Kingdom, a deluxe version of which just arrived last month. The first time ever Gavin heard music that moved him was the first time ever I saw your face. Let's let him tell you all about it. I think that um, it's probably hearing like my mum playing Roberta Flack and my dad had gotten her that record. I think it's the only record he got her there's a nice inscription on the back of it to her and um i remember just falling in love with the you know dark melancholy melodies and then probably the next major memory is is um queen and bohemian rhapsody because you know we had top of the pops every week when i was growing up and so they're a bit starved music but that was thursday night seven o'clock that was where it was all happening what was going on in the whole world and i don't know um that video was number one for about five years and i I remember having fond memories of watching that video in my sitting room with my with my with my mom and i don't have that you know i grew up with her but then then with my dad when i was like 12 so it's a nice Mm -hmm. nice memory for me um of music that's great now i remember reading something i mean i I don't ever believe everything i read on wikipedia but i believe it's said that you didn't talk until you were four is that true yeah there was this i was just very very um quiet and in some ways i still am but i uh yeah didn't manage to really speak or didn't find any point i mean i think there was a great help having my sister that, that probably spoke for me growing up under sort of the thumb of strong women between my mum and my sister but yeah i was very i was very uh, i was painfully shy till i was like about 20 yeah i would blush. Right. i'd blush if anyone spoke to me it was really difficult being trying to be cool but like Someone asks you the time and you feel yourself blushing. It just wasn't ready for it. It's just awful. Well, it seems like that's such an enormous hurdle to get over to eventually front a band. So <laughs> I guess at what what point did you finally speak up and say, I'd like to start playing an instrument? Um, later later on in my life, I mean, I sang first and then I started playing guitar really late. So I wasn't like a, a child uh, player or anything. It was when I was a teenager and I got a guitar from a girlfriend and I that was my first guitar and just started playing it. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to come to it later, I suppose, but you're always slightly playing catch up. So I continue to really work at my musicianship because I've always feel that I should have started like a little earlier. What, what were you singing? Were, were you singing in, in the family or in a band in like middle school or anything? Mm, I, I, there was no singing in my family. My family is not very musical at all. There was just a few good records they had. You, you mentioned your sister and your mom. And is the asshole brother in Everything's End, that's fictitious? Well, no, because I'm still looking for him. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's allegorical rather than literal. So I was in a band at school. But we spent more time thinking about the name of the band than actually rehearsing. <laughs> and when we did rehearse, we did like down the tube station at midnight jams. So we just basically, yeah. I felt like I was in a band so I could say I was in a band. I didn't really have any connection to it. It was a bit like, you know, just... Well, you, you spent so much time coming up with the names. So what, what did you come up with? Uh, you know, as, as I said, that, I thought, what did we come up with? No, we never got that. We never, <laughs> never agreed on one. We did, we played one school <laughs> show under the name of like, you know, I don't know, Monster Munch or something. But we weren't very good, but it was a real thrill and just weird. I'd grown up, my sister had her boyfriend in a band called The Nobodies. And so I used to go to their rehearsals when I was like 14, 15. And I liked the whole energy of it. And I I thought music was a really exciting um, world, but I never thought I could play it or do it or sing it or, you know what I mean? I just was like a regular zero kid. So Hmm. 
I got lost in music, but, but never felt confident enough that I could get an instrument and play along to it or anything like that. And it was only when I, when I, when I was leaving school that I suddenly was like, well, I definitely don't want a job. So what else can I do? You know, what's creative and, you know, and fun and, you know, you can make money and live a life and have beautiful girls around you. So that, that was that, that was the Eureka. And then you, how did you go from there? Um, I just, I, I left school and I decided I didn't want to go to a uh, college and, uh, I just wanted to get out in the world. And I met this kid called Sasha and he became my you know best friend. And we just basically did everything together. Um, and maybe we're in a band together. We just hung out together. It was like, I mean, we had girlfriends, so there'd be a sort of girlfriend time or something like that. But most of the time, our girls are with us. And I never had a friend that you just like, didn't matter if it was night or day, morning, afternoon, we just would always hang out. I don't know, I guess, any breakfast, you know, do that. Go, you know, play a bit of music, fucking, you know, get whatever we do, like silly kids, you know, we just did everything together. And he's a fantastic musician. He's now a film composer, Sasha Putnam. And he's just, oh, cool. He's uh, David Putnam's son, and he's a really, tremendous uh film composer it's like 35 movies and um, he did so much of the music that it was like i kind of probably let him do too much of it really and then when we as i well, i was in the first two bands with him and then he quit to go to moscow to boston to boston Conserv- conservatory and uh, i was forced to to to, to <clears throat> consider music on my own and to write music on my own and that's when i began to and my first song that i wrote was come down and so from there is where it all began for me so it's weird how rejection and um, people's dereliction of you can lead to great things. Come Down was the first song you wrote, mm-hmm. huh? First song I wrote wow. on guitar and, and sung, yeah. So when you played with Sasha, though, did you tour or play any shows together? Um, well, what happened is that in 2002, he'd, he then went to Moscow and he studied the conservatory there so he could score and do movies and stuff. And then I just paid a oh, way overpaid him to come on tour with bush so he toured with bush in 2002 to 2006 probably i don't know quite a while quite a few years yeah yeah i really overpaid him to come on tour with me and hang out with me again <laughs> and hang out with me and he again he hung out with me the whole time uh, so i was like i was like i can't tour without him you know i just I, you know i love this guy you know we're best friends so i wanted to say if you want me to tour as much as you want me to tour just let me um it's like, like, can I bring my mate? You know, and then he came, and he's he's married now. But when he was out on the road with me, he was um, he really lived the dream. <laughs> he lived the dream, <laughs> and his goal was to uh, his desire was things to impregnate the world. He had so much love, he just wanted to impregnate the world. <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> that's great. So, but then you you had a different band that you had toured with, right, and like played. Again, Wikipedia is telling me you opened up for Cindy Lauper in Big Country. I don't know how true that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, yeah, that was that was Midnight. Okay, that was my first band, and that was the one with Sasha. Yeah, or no? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Well, we were signed to Epic Records. We we sort of had two singles out. They never let us make a record, and never really got going. Muff Winwood was my sound. Was my A and R guy. Yeah, it was weird. So um, that was the Sasha's part of that. All all my journey. It's great. And still is still like he does him and his wife. They came here for their honeymoon. Part of their honeymoon was coming here. So Bush finally gets signed. Uh, what's the deal? You you did something on your own label, right? Yeah, we signed to Trauma Records. Yes, Trauma Records. Okay. Not my own. I mean, it was an independent label. Oh, okay, I thought there was something again. Some internet research. Oh, no. You never know. Oh, Ma- oh, oh. Mad Dog Winston Records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was part of my deal with uh, that's my publishing company. So that was just, that was what I was structured out on trauma records through interscope okay so i had interscope you know muscle there was again uh, something i'd read about uh, the deal had fallen through with hollywood records mm-hmm. and you were all working menial jobs yeah i went back to work i only ever had jobs that that paid money and had no future i never was going to do a <laughs> job where i could become indispensable because i i'm quite useful in certain areas you know so i didn't want to mm-hmm. be where i would be suddenly seduced by a paycheck or by a different concept of music so i worked very um you know just just typical building site laboring uh painting jobs 
after I finished that record, it went to Frank Wells was the guy that's the executive at Hollywood Records who tragically died in a helicopter accident. It went to to the rest of the, the music community there, Hollywood Records, and they said, 16 Stone, not only are there no singles, there are no album tracks on this album, this record. Wow. So they dropped us. That was just at the same time we were just we just got played, so we got dropped by them early in the year, I guess about May or June. And then I went back to work and I was painting 11 uh, dentist offices in, um, in, in, in uh, Oxford Circus in London. This is very Kafka-esque, you know? Yeah, is that definitely true? 11 dentist's office? Is that exactly true? 100%. That's completely true. That's amazing. It just seems like a funny anecdote. It was awful. But... It was awful because you're painting, in, the color was magnolia. So it's a sort of a, a creamy, as a dirty, butterscotchy, kind of it's not that dark but scotch very light but but scotch should like wear and tear if you do white you have to repaint it sooner so you do magnolia in these fucking offices and it's a sort of cheap and cheerful way out it does look really nice afterwards but there was 11 identical offices and so when you're in office number four you just made a record you thought your life was going somewhere you just want to shoot yourself in the face um yeah uh, because you're like wow here i am and so i was very People don't realize that when I did Bush, my third band, I had let go of all uh, commercial potential. Um, you know, that was the height of, of Britpop, it was the height of Oasis, of Blur, Suede, um, Supergrass, all those bands, great bands, but just a different sound to ours. And I felt like I was just destined to play North London pubs and cool clubs for like underground rockers you know, underground rock mm-hmm. music. You know what I mean? That's what it was. It was like that sort of music that was turning me on. That's where I saw Jane's Addiction um, at a tiny club. That's the size of the thing. And like, if you were massive, you played Brixton Academy, which was a beautiful right. venue in London. We played that five nights in a fire hub. We played there five nights. So that was that. So then all of this stuff is like the biggest shock to me. You know, it was never, there was never any, uh, there was no idea this was this was going to happen you know when i was actually trying to be my most create uh, commercial and most be accepted was like my leanest uh, most unloved years I, I remember reading somewhere when you guys were starting out that you weren't too keen on your voice but i mean i imagine that's something you also have to come to terms with well my voice was always the reason given why i had so much rejection and failure in england trying to get signed you know, I was trying to get signed for, well, Midnight, I was signed, my first band. But the, the next band I had, I my, the middle band wasn't signed. What, what was that band called? Uh, we called it Head. There was a number of okay. names, but Head was the best incarnation. Okay. <laughs> that was a great name for a band. And we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but how did you eventually get over this extreme shyness? Just got physically bigger, stronger, felt less vulnerable. I don't know, just grew out of it really i realized that everyone's fucked up and everyone's annoying and actually i like people that are shy they're more interesting and there's something you know there's nothing worse than a real cocky loud person it's just that's like to me it's the ultimate like it becomes a frequency so i mean mm-hmm. so many people like that big brash bravado and you know all that stuff and i'm just like I don't like people like that. <laughs> They're annoying. Yeah. So I don't mind. You know what I mean? I like, you know, being low key and having a laugh when you have a laugh, but I'm, I'm not a wallflower by any stretch of the imagination. But I just, I don't know. I got over it. You know, I stopped blushing. What can I tell you? I desensitized. Then you got the, got the deal finally. And then everything Zen was the first single. And at what point did you know that, okay, I don't have to paint dentist's office for my whole life? Um, probably when I did the first show in 95, um, at the, at CBGB's in New York and it was sold out and packed and everything Zen was on the radio and there's a lot of buzz around the band. And really that's my life began in February 95 in, in, uh, CBGB's. It changed irreversibly. Like that was it. It was just literally a, an about turn from the years of struggle to just literally it just, that's it till this phone call where'd you hook up with the other guys in bush i had a girlfriend um who introduced me to nigel and so i met him and we hung out and he didn't really want to do a band he was busy being paid for um for uh, adverts for training videos and things like that but if they're getting a thousand pounds a time so he was making a lot of money you know i was making 50 pounds a day painting and decorating or or being a laborer 
he was working on making a thousand quid and so i was like oh i totally understand you want to do that but i'll do these songs and i i took and come down little every single song on, on 16 stone in batches of four i'd say you know he did a really nice job on come down a beautiful demo he made of it for me and we recorded his house it's so much fun he's a really great musician and great programmer and everything he's very 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 good and then I was like, so should we write some stuff together? He's like, no, no, let's keep like that. We'll continue. You just bring songs to me and I'll demo them up. So that's what we always did. That was our process. Oh, that's interesting. And, th- and that was the same throughout his tenure in the band? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Talk to me a little bit about that adjustment between albums one and two. I mean, uh, there's that adage that you have like your whole life to make your first album and six months to make your second album yeah it it didn't really work like that with us um okay because well i only had two years to write the first bush record because i was in in the other band that didn't work so i didn't have all my life i didn't have those songs forever they they were two years old that was it Mm -hmm. so i was a bit unprepared because i was on the road and what i we did a record with steve albini and I think that we wanted to make a record that really showed what the band was like live. Um, and so we went in with Steve and we made this record. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. I think that we could have, in, in hindsight, it was a bit bloated. <laughs> it was a bit like, just kind of like a few less sections, a few less kind of ponderous moments. But, but you know, I'm pretty proud of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I wish that I just made 16 stone over and over and then I would have been playing stadiums, <laughs> would have been playing stadiums, but we always pushed and tried to do different things and embraced other forms of music. And I'm right back to into like fucking hardest, meanest rock I can think of. Cause it's all mm-hmm. I care about now. And I do love all kinds of music, but it's funny when I'm making it now and like the kingdom, I just fucking, I got, I got no time. I just like, I'm, I'm like hard music's hard and then the the, mm-hmm. the the singing and the melodies i'm always going for like that weirdly enough it's like beautiful melodies you know van morrison roberta flack stevie wonder you know like i think about all those singers how they made melody um and trying to put that over neanderthal riffs with beautiful music intertwined you know that's my whole work aesthetic Right. The music we're making now, there's a lot of defiance. You know, there's so much going on in the world. I mean, for me, being in a rock band, I I don't know. You know, we don't. I don't. It's, I can't sing songs. I it just. I'm just so affected by everything that's going on. Wherever you look, it's 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 staggering. The, the subject matter. You know, the planet, mental health, famine, uh, wars, uh, pestilence. This fucking corona. Uh, the, the political landscape, the racism, the hatred, the killing, the gun sprees, the school shootings. I mean, it's just like, what the fuck? Everything's like, mm-hmm. it's like, oh my God, you got to hang on to your fuck. You got to put a seatbelt on to just be alive. Well, yeah. Do you find then that makes writing easier just because there's just so much to write about or is it harder to focus? It's fucking way more going on. It's like, you just, you just, you just, it's like ripe fruit wherever I look. Yeah. What, what song came first in this new album? Oh, uh, Send in the Clowns. Uh, Our Time Will Come. Uh, those, those ones, Falling Away. And then, um, yeah, the last one was Flowers on a Grave in the Kingdom. They were there huh. a, a month before the record came out. That's funny. It's always the way, isn't it? That the, the last recorded is the first single. Yeah, because psychologically, you know, the label live with it. They get to know it. Then they go, but what else can you do? Then you do something that's exciting. And you go, this is what we're talking about. I didn't know if I'd be in a two-year writing spell of being held up by my label uh-huh. and told to do this. Every label does it. You deliver a record, get going on the artwork, everything's happening. They say, it's a couple more songs. Jimmy Iovine yeah. did it my whole career at, uh, in Scope, and you you understand you <laughs> understand the logic. You hate them for it because you want people to say thank you. This is amazing. It's a masterpiece. Right. But people always have said to me, "That's great. Have you got any more? Yeah. Listen, have you got any more? It's like fuck me. Like it's not a fucking. I'm not making donuts. I don't want to forsake this. Like for example, they wanted me to do another ballad, but I really stood by my guns and didn't do another ballad. I did two rock songs because I'd wanted the song that's on there undone to stay on there. Cause if I did a ballad mm-hmm. that they loved, I'm fucked for the other song. And I was like, no, this other song has got to come out. It's right for this. That'd be the single, the ballad, right? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, if we get to it, if the kingdom is, has a really good, just started and it's good reaction to it. So we've had two songs done really well. And now let's see if we can't uh, get uh, the third one away. It's interesting you mentioned Jimmy Iovine always asking for more. When you look back on the first phase of Bush, and it's interesting where you are at your career right now, because there were four albums in the original incarnation in the original like first sprint and then four albums now since the reunion yeah but when you look upon that those first four do do you have regrets it seems like you know you you've felt like uh razor blade suitcase was a little hurried or uh bloated no it wasn't hurried what, what, what i'm trying to say is sometimes i hear it and i just want to edit the, a little bit you know i mean you know yourself as a as a journalist or as a writer when you edit out you know uh, uh, something is as, is as good as its weakest moment Mm -hmm. And so if you can take out um, sections, I mean, this is a couple of things. I listened to the song I was listening to the other day. It's like, you know, instead of coming on a downbeat, it goes round a whole section before I start a thing. It's like, I go, what the fuck was that about? Why did I do that? <laughs> what was I waiting for? You know, kind of, yeah. where was I? So it was a little bit where, you know, a little bit round and round it here and there. But look, it was a great experience and the record went straight to number one. It was my only number one record, so. Um, yeah. I'll take it and I'm not going to criticize it. There's some beautiful things on there. I could sing better. I do. I sing better now. I'm a better singer than that record, but you, what are you going to do? You know, that's the whole point. You got to keep improving. It'd be terrible if it was the other way around. Like I was like, Oh, man, right. If only I could sing like that now. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what did you learn? How, how did you learn to sing better? It's just through repeated process. Yeah. Listening to myself, you know, and just like, sometimes it's funny singers. That's our job. I just, mm -hmm. I just got to take the time to listen to myself, listen to sound I'm making, adjust, adapt, you know, warm up properly, have a great, um, have a great tuning, have great timing, you know, always looking for that melody. Right. Did you, did you ever work with a voice coach? Um, I did. I had a few sessions with one guy, you know, many years ago because I, when I worked with Bob Rock, we did a, I used, um, La, uh, James Hetfield's warm up tape. Um, and mm -hmm. I'd never really warmed up. So I heard J I had James Hetfield's tape to uh, just warm up to that the Bob had. And uh, I never took it because, you know, it's not, you can't have someone's warm up tape. But I borrowed it. <laughs> and um, so I got my own and I, and I went to see this, this, uh, this singing teacher. And in fact, I contacted him recently because my son, uh, Kingston, is really into singing. So I thought he should get a few lessons, right? Do you know how much this guy is? Um, I, I'm not going to say names, so it's, I'm not putting him down. Or if you rang him up and asked him for a lesson, he would charge you that. But this guy is a really, really good teacher. But he, so he teaches. what, And he's not going to charge me this rate. He's giving me a family rate, which is a lot less, but still a crazy amount. What do you think he charges for one hour of singing class? Go on. Just go uh, for it. A grand? I mean. So more than. What made you think that crazy number? But it's 1500 I'm like. Oh my God. You're fucking, you're just not a brain surgeon. You're fucking singing teacher. <laughs> 1500. I was like, can you believe that people even have 1500 to spend? Because it probably the chances are that most people that take lessons aren't the uh, ones out earning the money. Uh, you, there's people in the, um, you know, the uh, exploratory stage, the finding itself, learning how to sing really well. So I was like, wow. So he's given me a mate's rate, but it's still a mate's rate that's like a mate's rate with a punch on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> like so, cheaper than my divorce amazing. lawyer. Put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so have you. And that's uh, not, I, she's not cheap. I, I would imagine. It's interesting you mentioned, you know, growing up that your family wasn't that musical and there wasn't much going on there, but I imagine your your children and you. And uh, you mentioned a divorce lawyer. So your, your ex-wife, they, they are exposed to a lot of music and it must be something special to yeah. play together. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite amazing because my son now, he's blossoming and he just, it's, um, it's just what I always waited for and always wanted was for him to be inspired about something. And he's so into it. So it's wonderful to be able to like sit with him and listen to his taste in music and I said to him the other day, is it weird? Do you think you're the only kid whose father likes the music heavier than he does? Because he's like really into <laughs> like, he's super into emo, alternative emo. And, you know, no one, no one wants to, needs, wants to tune their guitar, but it sort of works. It's all blue notes and I love it. It's a very beautiful sound. It reminds me of all the 
of the thousands of records I would get when I'd go to all the kind of, you know, sub pop and uh, rough trade, I'd go into all these independent record stores and just like buy $800 worth of CDs and go, go to mm-hmm. the back of my bus with like just literally 50 CDs that I would buy and walk out and put on my bus and there's all you know it was such a wonderful time you know of crossing america and finding out all these bands and getting to know a lot of them and taking a lot of them on tour but just finding them through independent record stores and that was just an incredible time all the touch and go bands um amazing yeah so sitting down with him and let him so it, it's very very beautiful and the other ones are coming along but obviously they're they're younger and they didn't have they're they're not ready yet but yeah it's it's, it's a beautiful thing right but they're, they're all interested huh yeah and when they pick it he picks up every wall of my guitar oh that's tuned to open c oh shit dad and he learned he began learning at a younger age than you did yeah right? and he's got he's very good he's got great fingers he's a proper guitar player i mean i sort of f- muddled my way through and i sort of play better now but but uh he's got proper guitar fingers and proper guitar intuition he's a better version of me that's awesome do you, do you play together yeah yeah sometimes yeah. i sometimes uh yeah we'll, we'll just do stuff and it's, it's amazing i did we did it the other night and i, I wrote down we're both in shorts and i was like i never thought that i would the day would come where i'd be sitting like in a pair of shorts and jamming with you this is this is the greatest out night of my life <laughs> What's the significance of the shorts? Just late night, you know, I went in to just hang out and then for put the other kids had gone to bed, went in to check in on him, see how he's doing, and just sat down. And he was in a pair of shorts and just, you know what I mean? Just like us, <laughs> us at home chilling, you know? And, okay. Uh, so I pick up a guitar, he's playing guitar, so I just play around him a little bit. And it's, it was really fun. I was like, this is, this, is a, this is great. One thing I want to ask you is, you know, you have had – a romantic involvement with so many singers and it's interesting too how their music is not similar to yours in all ways and and do you have to appreciate the music a person makes in order to be in a long-term relationship with them i think it helps and i was always really proud of um gwen and her you know fantastic showmanship on stage you know she's a really great performer no doubt it's a fantastic band i mean they're a great band it's always fun to watch them it's always lively so Definitely not my kind of music in many ways. In other ways, it's the music I heard more than any music for right. 20 years, you know. So, <laughs> you know, Susie that introduced me to uh, Nigel, was, uh, she was in a band called The Baby Animals, a much more right. incredible blues singer, great voice. Used to, I used to love watching her and watching her sing and just couldn't believe her voice. You know, I was really, really... Uh, so I, I love having uh, that uh, side of, you know, personal life, but... I'd be terrified now because I do like, you know, the last girlfriend that I had, you know, could travel with me. And if I was to fall in love with a, another performer or another artist, whilst on one hand it's really attractive because you relate, on the other hand, you just know that you're fucked for spending time and for, you know, sharing time with them because they're like always busy as well. What what is your favorite No Doubt song or your favorite Gwen Stefani song? Uh, probably one she hasn't un- she never released, so there's no point in telling you that one. But um, I think that uh, that obviously on Hollaback Girl, she really was um, pretty incredible. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's a few there's a lot of songs that she wrote <laughs> that I might be part of that I that have uh, obviously a soft spot for. But probably uh, um, some of the later ones, uh, not so much. Yeah, uh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if you got royalties for songs that were about you? <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, mm, no, I'd be I'm all right. No, uh, no, <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. This is blood money. <laughs> now you guys are scheduled to play um, some driving gigs. Yeah, we do. We're we're jumping into that whole bring your cars in and uh, beep with your horns, use your headlights. So I, I look, it's a stopgap till uh we get to go we just want to tour again you know with this fucking record it's amazing we want to play it live we've got the fucking um uh you know probably gonna have to look at making another record for this uh for for next year when we go back on tour so it's, it's like oh man it's so frustrating this record is like it's a very studio record but it's super built for uh, for shows and excitement and, and every song we make has to has to have a um, ability to be in the set. You know what I mean? When you look at the song, mm-hmm. you look at the, the look at the catalog. They have to be strong. They have to be survived with those other songs. Yeah. Have you even played out any of the songs? 
These live streams are like a TV show. You basically do a TV show. I think the next step of that is to do that actually. We did some of it live because you do it where you, you use it. But like, if you if you make a terrible fuck up, you know, you just can go back and redo it, you know. So a bit like that. It's a bit cheating like that. But we generally used we used all the takes. So that was fun to do. But uh, we played one show in um, February in Las Vegas, and that, yeah. that was the, that was where we could um, we could play Flowers on a Grave. But that was all. It was just a bit weird because the first time we played it, no one knew it, and it was just like kind of get, get trying to get to the end. Couldn't really yeah. lose ourselves in it, you know. You got to be able to lose yourself in everything, you know. Right, right, yeah. There's that anecdote about like Led Zeppelin playing Stairway to Heaven for the first time, and. Robert Plant like answers an interview. He's like, "Of course, who cared? I mean, nobody knew it." Right. So we touched upon briefly just the two phases of the band and, and pre hiatus. But when you think about that phase versus the new phase, it seems like y- you have more more energy for it now. Is that true? I mean, I like to think I've always, you know, I've always had energy for it. I mean, I don't know whether the um, the energy that I have for it now is so palpable and it's so visualized on stage and on the live recordings, you know, that, that people see that somehow my enthusiasm, you know, surely it can't have been like this all along, but I think it was. I think I've always been this ambitious. I've always been this driven. And I just, I love making music and I'm really grateful that I have anyone that gives a shit and wants to hear it. You know what <laughs> I mean, like it's been a really long time and like, I can't believe that I still have the luxury of the attention of some people. You look at all the bands from 1995 and there's very few of them that are still around. Yeah, I mean, the problem is the world is so fragmented now that you can, um, you know what I mean? That you just don't hear other uh, people's, um, what they're doing. You could, you know, someone could be on tour for a year. I see them out somewhere like, Hey man, how you doing? How you been? Oh, I was been on tour for a year. The, I, oh shit, I didn't know. You know, you just don't know. Oh, your band's still together. Oh, that's great. So right. it's sort of like I think this, most bands seem to find a way to just exist, even if it's not in a a big way. We found a way to still be on radio, still get to you know do this podcast. You know, it's just I I don't know. We, we're very lucky, but I also at the same time know that I'm a victim of it, that I, for a lot of people, you know, I don't know if they're aware of us because, you know, you move into a, you know, suddenly you move along or you move into a different genre or your life changes. And there's a whole new wave of people listening to, you know, now kids listening to Youngblood, you know, it's, it's, right. it's just hard. You just can't, uh, you can't expect to be anything but a working musician after a certain time, you know, and we're just lucky we have this catalog. So we can like, you know, elevated working musicians. And the rest of the people who are in the first incarnation, what, what are they up to now? Speaking of um, the whole, I, what are you doing? Yeah, where are they, where are they now? Um, I, yeah. so, um, well, Dave, he's the bass player. He's a family man and he's uh, at home with his kids and doing art, making sculpture. He went to art school and lives in Bristol. Uh, Nigel had a guitar store in Bath and just lives on in the wilderness countryside, I think, with his family. Um, and Robin is uh, in Hermosa Beach, just living his life there with his daughter. And, um, you know, I don't know, it's, it's just weird. I'm, 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 it's, it's quite upsetting to me. You know, I don't like the, you know, relationships that end and, and partnerships that move on, but it's the nature of life. And um, the trick is, I think, that it is is about accepting that, that the life is a series of chapters and, and you can't bring all the chapters into each new chapter, you know? Mm. So, so that's that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. Is, is, is there songs from your career that you won't touch anymore because of that sort of approach or? No, no, no. I celebrate them all. I appreciate them all. They, a lot of life went into those songs. And so, no, I don't have that, you know, I don't have that sort of reverse psychology about the material. Like, Certain songs I don't think I got right, and certain songs where I, you know, could have done better. That, that I, I can't help but think on that. There's a few songs that I love, but where I, for instance, didn't nail the lyric or something, and didn't elevate it enough. Sometimes it's not, you know, that that kind of beats me up on certain songs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't like to play those songs. But then I don't play them for a while. Then I feel bad, and I play them, and people seem to like them. So what do I know? I'm just, in, you know, just, just happy to be here. <laughs> One thing we should probably touch upon is the deluxe edition of the new album. What what's deluxe about it? 
Uh, Deluxe about it is a couple of songs that I didn't have a chance to put on the main record that I was very disappointed about. Beware False Prophets and Live Another Day. So I'm really happy that people get to hear those. And I think they're very topical and the discussion of, uh, of the existence of God. And um, I wonder how that will go down. And then Mike Garson, Bowie's longtime piano player, rang me up and um, asked me to perform a song with him for Music Airs. So I uh, wondered if he'd ever done a very slow version <clears throat> of Heroes. He hadn't. So I said, just send me the most depressing version of Heroes you can imagine, you know, as slow as possible. Mournful, 4 a.m., very, very uh, meditative piano. And he sent me staggering piano and I sang it. And that's the first song to lead it. So I, me and Mike, um, version of Heroes. And then he joined me. He played with me on Undone, which is a mm-hmm. song on, on the record. He, he loved that song. And so he... We, he joined us on it and I just took the band as way as much as possible and gave it up to Mike. That's what we got. So there's a good, and then there's a couple of live versions of Kingdom, the Kingdom and Flowers on the Grave. So six songs that people, um, you know, that won't have heard and won't, you know, haven't been out and all that stuff. So exciting from, you know, I'm excited for people to hear that. And I hope that Heroes gets in a movie or something. It's a real, I mean, it's such a, it's such a fantastic song. That, oh my god it was such a privilege to sing it the worst part about it was it just took like two takes three takes because you're singing heroes you can't fuck about <laughs> yeah it's not like you forget the words or or that you're gonna sing it so half assed oh sorry i missed that oh, so, you know you're gonna sing it like you know you cannot fuck around this is like yeah this is this is this is where it's at this is the mecca yeah so listen to it and uh, have a have a think whether I, I i achieved that or not right right so but one thing you you mentioned um like having the rest of the band sit out and and i always wonder that like about a song like glycerine was was there a version with drums and bass on it nearly nearly yeah. we were sort of prepped for it and then it just we just left it like that it was so weird because it's so weird recording it i remember i'd never recorded a song with no band you know it always had like a drum it with me all my recording so it was a weird one to sing with no just a click and just my guitar but but i found a way obviously you know you definitely reached a level that uh you know you beyond your wildest dreams at any point did it become out of control or were you able to uh stay grounded throughout the whole time no it totally fucks you up and you you lose a lot of perspective and a lot of things but you also come around to realizing how beautiful it is, how fleeting it is. I mean, I've been doing it for nearly so over 25 years, um, but it's incredible. I, I love it, but I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this life, but I don't take it for granted. And I just try and apply myself and work at it and think about it and just try and improve all the time, you know? Yes, indeed. Gavin Rosdale, trying to improve all the time. Hey, if you are trying to improve all the time, you can take a class with Berkeley Online. And if you want to save 100 bucks doing so, visit musicismylifepod.com and redeem this special discount. That's right, because you are a loyal listener of the Music Is My Life podcast, we'll give you $100 off your first class with us. All you have to do, visit musicismylifepod.com right now. This episode was edited by Talia Smith. Mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora. All visual assets coordinated by Mike De Benedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Ashley Pointer, Amanda Brophy, Madison Wolf, Dove Shore, and thanks to you for listening. Join us on Monday, December 7th for special guests Ryan and Jack Metzger from the band AJR. Stay safe, listeners, and stay inspired. <laughs>